It's uh, always great to be back. It almost seems like I never left because I see a lot of uh, familiar faces in the audience. And uh, um, in, that, uh, in that sense, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to interact with, with people here. And indeed, through our various centers and institutes now at Northwestern, I think the interaction between Argonne and Northwestern is stronger than ever and growing. And so the idea of doing collaborative science between the two institutions is one that is appealing in many contexts. And so we're, we're promoting this very heavily. And I think there's going to be some very exciting science that involves not only uh, many divisions at Argonne, but also involves uh, the user facilities, you know, primarily APS and CNM in this particular context, which makes for some really exciting, exciting future science. Um, what I'm going to tell you about today is, a, is really only part of what we do. A large fraction of the research we do involves solar energy related work, and this goes back historically a long, long time. Um, we do other things as well, and we do other aspects of solar energy, but what I'm going to focus on today is more of a, a material structural theme with regard to the solar energy materials. And this largely uh, involves uh, a focus toward materials for uh, unconventional solar cells. In other words, solar cells that involve molecular materials rather than traditional materials like silicon or, um, semi or traditional inorganic semiconductors. And so in that context, uh, what you're going to find as we move along here is the fact that we're going to take some concepts that we and others developed over the years from uh, the fundamental aspects of how photosynthesis works, and that's really the origin of my activities here at Argonne many years ago, to, um, to tell us literally how to design self-assembling and self-recognizing systems that can produce the kind of molecular order you need in a, um, in a uh, material that is going to be effective for moving holes and electrons to electrodes in, in a uh, solar cell. And so without further ado, let's, uh, let's just talk about what the problem is. It's like preaching to the choir here at Argonne, of course, and that is we know what the problem is, and here's the problem in a nutshell. We need to produce a lot of energy in the next century. And this is largely, as we all know, due to the fact that uh, the standard of living in places in the world that uh, had a previously a fairly poor standard of living is increasing rapidly, and that is really predicated on more energy utilization. In order to do this without destroying the planet's uh, environment, we need to essentially find alternatives to the, the typical energy sources we have today, for instance, fossil fuels. In order to do that, uh, the only source out there with the capacity and resilience to do this is really solar energy because of the simple fact that we get a whole heck of a lot of solar energy impinging on the Earth uh, constantly. And we don't even have to be that good to, uh, to uh, utilize enough of it in order to do the job. And so the statistics are compelling that even if we're US-centric, uh, we, we, we can generate 2,200 terawatts on, on the land mass of the US alone, when in fact we need only a small fraction of that. This doesn't necessarily mean we have to cover the entire state of Arizona with solar panels, which some people might be perfectly happy with doing, but um, what we need to do is, for instance, utilize surfaces in general throughout the country in, but to better effect. For instance, building materials, roofs, et cetera, can be uh, utilized for this purpose in a, in a kind of uh, politically in, you know, uh, insensitive way. And so this can be done, but we have to, we have to still know how to do this. And of course, as I mentioned, we're taking, we're taking lessons from nature. And of course, the, less, the main lesson from nature is this three plus billion year old process called photosynthesis that evolved to um, essentially use light energy to drive the metabolism of cyanobacteria. But in the process, we benefited because essentially the byproduct of this process is oxygen and then the atmosphere changed and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, Higher life forms evolved from, from the uh, notion that one could use bioenergetics to greater effect in an oxidizing atmosphere rather than in a reducing atmosphere. So we've learned a lot about photosynthesis in the last 40, 50 years. I mean, we've gone essentially from a black box 
in which some physical experiments had some real, re, some interesting suggestions as to how things work, to essentially molecular detail, where we, we now have x-ray crystal structures of the key proteins involved in the process. Uh, of course, this has had a resurgence in the last five, six, seven years uh, with the, the new funding and new opportunities that have come along in this field, and a new urgency that has been felt with regard to uh, having renewable energy that would replace the current energy technologies. Um, and this, unfortunately, has resulted in a lot of hype as well. And so sometimes, you know, you hear, you hear people talk about uh, artificial leaves and things of that nature. Uh, we're still a long way from being in that position, but it turns out that this is an idea that actually has been uh, around a very long time. And uh, the next slide shows you essentially how long, oops, I, I guess, let me, let me go to this slide first. This shows you how, how long it's been around. And this is, this is an article that appeared in the February issue, issue of Chemical Engineering News, which is American Chemical Society's uh, weekly news magazine. And you'll notice there are a few names here with this, associated with this, this article. Uh, some of the names are certainly familiar with it for, from, for you, and that is, it was the photosynthesis group at Argonne here back in 1976, headed by Joe Katz. And in fact, at that time, this idea of a synthetic leaf that mimics plants' light conversion was an idea that was out there. This idea that uh, we thought about and we're, 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 we're working on at that time. And so, you know, it's not, it's not such a new concept when you, when you hear about these things. But so you, one has to be a little bit careful about uh, uh, trying to read too much into current press about this. You really have to understand the fundamental science before we get to the point where we can actually do this sort of thing. But it's an old idea that's, that's, that has some currency. As I mentioned, the, uh, the natural photosynthesis that we all know and love has taught us some things. And now, I'm gonna distill 40 years worth of work, or 45 years worth of work maybe, into four bullet points. And basically, a lot of people have developed and, and discovered and, and elucidated these wonderful uh, X-ray diffraction structures of photosynthetic reaction centers, in this case from bacteria, Here's the, the cross-section without the protein of the bacterial reaction center, just the cofactors. And here's this wonderful multi-protein complex uh, molecular machine that actually splits water, photo, so-called photosystem two, from green plants. So nature has taught us four basic features about these systems. Number one, that when you have organized arrays of light harvesting molecules, they funnel energy to sites where actual light-driven photochemistry occurs, in other words, charge separation. And this is because photosynthesis is essentially a low light level process. In other words, it has to function with, with modest amounts of light and do so efficiently. As this diagram indicates, multi-step of charge, uh, or charge transport stores the energy needed to drive chemical reactions. In other words, the way charges move in photosynthetic systems is by a downhill gradient across, across a membrane, uh, where the charges are generated by a light-driven charge separation as the initial event. So nature uses multi-step electron transfer to, to increase the lifetime of the charge separation to be useful. Uh, thirdly, uh, and I'm not going to talk about catalysis today, but nature uses multi-electron proton coupled reactions, for instance, to split water and to do many other biochemical processes. And last but not least is something that we would strive to do but we can't do now is the fact that we, we can try to or self-organize systems into assemblies that have emergent properties, and we'll see some of that in my remarks today. But what we simply can't do yet is have a system that undergoes uh, some sort of self-repair mechanism as, as natural living systems can do. So uh, this is going to be a hard one to achieve in many, many contexts. Just a, a brief tip of the hat to the catalysis effort, uh, basically, in the catalysis effort, our efforts are designed to split water to produce hydrogen, oxygen is a byproduct, of course, and to reduce carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide, and to essentially produce synthesis gas, or syngas, as a feedstock for, for chemical processes. You can essentially make the chemical world out of syngas using existing technology. We've been able to generate a variety of molecular complexes that actually demonstrate some of these effects, both for proton reduction and for water splitting. In this particular example, we published a couple of years ago. 
actually using the APS to uh, do time-resolved X-ray absorption spectroscopy to identify key intermediates in the uh, catalytic cycle of this water-splitting catalyst. And so basically structural efforts in this context are very important as well and uh, will play a, a really critical role in the future in terms of being able to identify intermediates on the fly that are very difficult to uh, understand and to identify using any, any other techniques. In terms of self-assembly, nature produces a lot of ring-shaped structures in the protein domain that actually have chlorophyll cofactors that communicate with one another electronically. We've uh, looked at this over the years in a variety of other contexts where we can actually get so-called biomimetic assemblies, for instance, multiple chlorophyll systems, here another set of more multiple chlorophyll systems, even prismatic systems that have these various molecular struts to generate all sorts of shapes and sizes to study energy transfer properties using derivatives that are essentially related to the natural pigments. So this I would ter term a biomimetic uh, type of approach to this type of, type of system. But more importantly, I think, is a sort of bio-inspired approach which uses the concepts from photosynthesis to produce other systems. And indeed, one of our favorites, favorite molecules is this pigment that's used in red car paint, uh, a perylene diamide pigment, because it's incredibly robust. In other words, it's hard to oxidize, it's a very good electron acceptor, absorbs visible light readily, and you can keep it out in the sunshine for years on end, and it simply doesn't, doesn't photodestruct. So it seems to be the kind of molecular material that one would want in a solar-driven device. But we need to be able to design solar cells that are thin-layer solar cells based on such things, and so what we focused on is generating a whole host of molecules which can self-assemble to form stacked assemblies. And let me elaborate on this just a bit. For instance, if one had a series of molecules that were essentially radial rays or concentric rings, where if one shined light on the system, one could transfer an electron from a core molecule to an intermediate green, green molecule to another intermediate blue molecule, uh, one could separate positive and negative charges and have the charges hopefully move up and down these, these ring-shaped conduits and ultimately get to an electrode. It's, good, it's a good idea to surround one charge carrier with, its, with the opposite carrier insulated by the green material in order to, when these guys come together on a surface, we want to keep them actually uh, charge uh, separated so that the positive charges here are completely isolated from the negatives which are circulating in each of these conduits. The idea of a conduit, idea, a conduit model is, is very simple. If you can separate charge and have the two charges last for a period of time that is longer than the movement of each of those individual charges within the conduit, those charges then can be collected by electrodes through some sort of hopping mechanism through the conduit before the recombination occurs. And so you can have the best of two worlds. In other words, you can have an ordered system that will give you, in principle, better performance, just like single crystal silicon gives you better performance than amorphous silicon. But at the same time, you retain the ability of the molecules to self-recognize and to build ordered assemblies automatically, which means that you can print these materials, you can spray them on, you do some sort of annealing or treatment process which then elicits the order, and then you're good to go in a thin film with reasonable order that gives you higher performance. And so in no case have we ever seen yet that lower, a lower degree of order results in higher performance. You can do this another way. You can do this in a linear system. For instance, if you had a donor, some sort of bridging molecule, and an electron acceptor, if you can get them to stack like this and generate a charged pair, uh, essentially splitting the exciton that's generated with light, the electrons can move in one conduit and the holes can move in another as long as you can make an ordered assembly where these uh, conduits for opposite charges are isolated from one another. And so this is basically the idea behind uh, some of the work I'm going to tell you about. So we need to choose a chromophoric electron donor or acceptor that is susceptible to this self-assembly. And so Frank Werthner and his group have developed a little series of, of benchmarks involving association constants between the ability of, of big uh, polycyclic aromatic molecules to stack on one another. And you can see 
Some of the usual suspects are here, like porphyrins, which are related to chlorophylls, and some, here's our perylene diimide, which is really a very good uh, stacking material. And so this self-association is what we depend on. So what I'm going to tell you about initially is some work about a, a one particular molecule that acts as a good donor, a tetrabenzoporphyrin, which has the properties of having a more uh, solar-friendly spectrum in the sense that it absorbs red light much better than a regular porphyrin, as you can see from this graph here. And uh, we can actually attach things to this tetrabenzoporphyrin uh, quite, quite readily. And so we're going to use this as our uh, hole donor, if you're, or excuse me, hole carrier, if you will. And we're going to use our perylene diamide as the, as the electron carrier. And so after a few iterations, we produced this particular molecule, which we published last year, in which we have a single tetrabenzoporphyrin in the middle, a tailored spacer, which has a molecular geometry that promotes electron transfer from the core here to the periphery and impedes the electron transfer back, as we'll see in a moment. And now we have four of these, these rather sticky uh, perylene diamide molecules around the periphery. So it turns out when in solution, if you look at the optical spectrum of this material, what you find is the function of concentration. Here are the bands. The blue, blue most band and the red most band are due to the porphyrin. The two in the middle here are due to the perylene diamide. You can see as the concentration goes up, the ratio of these bands changes. And so why is that? It turns out the ratio changes because as these molecules stack upon one another at higher concentrations, the electronic transition uh, of the second band, the blue most band, becomes more strongly allowed, and that of the red most band becomes disallowed. This is classic exciton dipole-dipole uh, coupling theory that was developed by Davidoff years ago and, and uh, uh, expounded upon again by Kasha uh, back in the, the mid-60s. And so this is well-known stuff. It tells you that the molecules are, in fact, stacking upon one another in a way that is perhaps useful, but it doesn't tell you anything about structure. And so that's where we come to the APS and say, OK, we're going to do some scattering work. And basically, we can do solution scattering because, as all of you know, at a high brightness synchrotron source, you can get the kind of signal noise you need in order to su subtract out the solvent contribution to the scattering. And so using a, uh, in a small angle regime, using a Guinea analysis, we can pull out uh, the radius of gyration of this object we've created, which is got a pretty big radius, about 27 angstroms, so it's a pretty big object. And from the wide, usually from mostly the wide angle regime, we can actually model uh, using a PDF analysis what the structure of this, this, this system looks like. And it turns out, in this particular case, what best models it is a dodecamer. I mean, clearly, it's, it's an equilibrium structure that is in, in equilibrium with, with other structures, but it's primarily a dodecamer uh, in the distribution. And so this is a pretty, pretty nice uh, stack structure. So the question is, if we shine light on the structure, what happens to the charges? Well, it turns out one of the techniques we always rely on is femtosecond transient absorption, because many of these processes are very fast. They occur on a time scale of picoseconds. And so this is no, 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 no different in the sense that when we absorb light by the, por the porphyrin absorbs light, we then transfer a, an electron from the excited state of the porphyrin. Uh, and notice there's chemist versus physicist language here. A chemist would say excited state in a single, in a single molecule in solution. A physicist in a solid state would say we're generating an exciton on the porphyrin, which then splits, giving the electron to the acceptor and leaving the hole on the porphyrin. So that, indeed, in this case, we get an 80 picosecond charge transfer to the PDI. And this is noted by the fact that we have this band build up in the infrared here. And uh, basically, we get a pretty good yield of charge separation. But what's even more remarkable about this system is the fact that the recombination reaction is relatively slow. It takes 170 nanoseconds. Now, remember, we're dealing with the dodecamer here. We're not dealing with a, a single molecule. And so it turns out if we go to very, very low concentrations and try to look at the monomeric regime, this drops to about 60 nanoseconds. So basically, the lifetimes are longer in the assembly. So we have an emergent property here. Things are better in the assembly. And so the question is, are they good enough? In other words, if we had a hopping rate of a few picoseconds per layer, we could easily get to an electrode in 170 nanoseconds with a, a sample that was 1 to 200 nanometers thick. 
which is the typical thickness of an active layer in an organic solar cell. So we're in a good shape kinetically here, and so basically this shows that you can actually get in even one step the correct time regime for the charge separation in this large assembly. But how do we know that the electron and hole are actually moving independently in this, in this assembly, and not, not that they're in lockstep stuck in the same molecule? Now we're going to rely on something that goes back to the, historically to the mid-70s, to the old photosynthesis days, to the Joe Katz, Jim Norris days. And basically, at that time in photosynthesis, it was noted that one thing that could, that could occur was that when you photoexcite a system to its lowest excited singlet state and then transfer the electron very rapidly, you got what was called a spin-correlated radical pair. In other words, the two spin states here remain in a singlet configuration until nuclear spin interactions result in a spin flip, which puts them in a triplet interaction uh, regime. This is, this, is, this is really a true spin entangled pair like a, any physicist would love. And so what happens from these, this pair is that this triplet radical pair can recombine to a triplet state and the singlet radical pair can combine to, a, to the ground state. But this pair itself has some interesting properties which can allow us to learn something about the system. For instance, the singlet radical pair energy is split from the triplet by the exchange interaction between those two spins, so-called 2J. 2J is proportional to distance exponentially, so that's one measure of distance. Another measure of distance, if we are in zero magnetic field, these two spins have a dipolar interaction between each other, which splits those levels provided we're in a in a slowly rotating solid in solution, or excuse me, object in solution, or in a solid state. And so that dipolar interaction goes as obviously one, one over r, r cubed. And so if we put the system in a magnetic field, we Zeeman split off two of those triplet levels that are there, leaving one of the triplet levels invariant with field. And so these two levels will mix. And so these are our quantum mechanically mixed levels. And so what we're going to try to do is induce transitions between these mixed levels and each of these levels, which uh, it turns out are not going to be populated simply because we entered the system through the singlet radical pair. And so what you end up with is a four-level system, two mixed levels with singlet and triplet character, which have all the population initially. And then we can induce transitions to the empty levels, empty triplet levels. Two are enhanced absorption and two are emissive. It's just like a laser, basically. You can enhance absorption in this direction, and you get stimulated emission in this direction. And so when we do that, we get, a, we get a strange looking EPR spectrum. This is not a derivative. This is actually an absorption spectrum where these lines are upside down and these are straight side up. And so indeed, uh, that kind of spectrum is shown, is seen not only in, in this slowly moving object in solution, but it's also seen in the solid state. And when we, can, when we simulate the spectrum, we can analyze it and it comes down to telling us basically that the distance between the two spins, between the two charges, is on the order of 27 angstroms. Now, if we measure what the distance in the molecule is, it's not nearly as long. It's only 17. So the two charges have actually escaped each other and are moving independently in this particular object. And for this size object, they're on average about six layers apart. So we've, we've essentially accomplished what we want in the sense that we want to have a system where we can separate charge rapidly and do so efficiently, and then have the two charges not feel each other and then move around in the system. And then ultimately, if we can orient such a system in between two electrodes, we can collect those charges perhaps more efficiently than otherwise. There are other ways to look at this problem, and that is you can actually go back and steal another chapter from nature. And we've done that uh, in the context of using the ability of a DNA base. Here's a, here's a guanine. Guanine uh, forms some interesting structures in natural DNA called G quadruplexes. And these are in G-rich regions of the DNA structure. And what happens is they're catalyzed by the presence of a, an alkali metal ion like, like sodium or potassium. And what happens is the hydrogen bonding scheme in a 4G DNA bases uh, forms a cluster called a G-quartet that is, that is coordinated to, for instance, a potassium ion. And the interesting thing about these G quartets is then they can further assemble into layered stacks. And it turns out that chemists have learned how to control this assembly so that you can actually have discrete layering 
with discrete numbers. And so the idea here was, can you build a structure that has interesting properties from an electronic point of view by looking at discrete layers rather than a random distribution of, of, of layered structures? And so we did this with uh, this perylene diamide dye again as, an elect as a photooxidant. And it turns out that the guanine base is one of the, is of the four DNA bases is the easiest of the, those to oxidize. So our, oxi or our, our, uh, our electron donor is going to be the G molecule itself within this quartet structure. And so you know, we, there are various ways to construct this. And as I mentioned here, you can see the redox potentials. The G base is the easiest to oxidize. And so what we want to do is form these structures and then allow them to layer where the dye molecule associates with its neighbors. And then the Gs are all nicely arrayed in the middle here as sort of a core structure, sort of a core shell kind of structure. We use NMR to figure out what kind of structure we have initially. And this is where we use NMR in con conjunction with synchrotron uh, scattering work to actually figure out what this thing really is in, in solution. And so indeed, what we find here is that these sharp NMR lines as a function of temperature are, are, are due to these, these six resonances. And what that tells us basically is that we have a specific sense to this structure. What do I mean by sense? Well, it turns out that not only do these structures, can they stack, but it turns out that there's a, there's a left-handed, right-handed sense to these structures and how they can stack. They can be either be going the same direction or opposite directions. We can have essentially C4 C, C symmetry or D4 symmetry. We can stack 16 of them, or we can have 16 Gs with a stack of four, four units, or we can have you know, two one way, two the other way, and so forth. And it turns out what we have to determine is whether we have C4 symmetry or D4 symmetry, and then we have to determine how many. It turns out the NMR experiment is great for determining the fact that you have C4 symmetry. The NMR lines would be totally messed up if you had the D4 symmetry. But this still doesn't really certify how many you've got there. And so uh, what we've done is two experiments. We continued the NMR experiments, and we can do a diff diffusion-ordered uh, NMR type of experiment where you actually measure the diffusion coefficient by NMR at, at high field. And by doing that, we can find that the, that the hydrodynamic radius of this object is about 29 angstroms. And so if we look at stem to stern here, middle to edge, it's getting pretty close to that. There, here's 26, here's about 25. And so basically, that looks like it's about the right dimensions from a hydrodynamic sense. But what about from the synchrotron work? Well, if we do, do once again, the Sachs wax experiment, here's the, here's the scattering curve. Here's our Gagné plot. Notice that the radius of gyration is actually a fraction of the hydrodynamic radius. And we think that is the case simply because we're more or less blind to the alkane tails that are sitting at the ends of the dyes. We're, very, we're much more sensitive in terms of a scattering profile to the aromatic cores. And essentially, that's re one of the reasons why, or it's the principal reason why the two, the two numbers are quite different. We can model this, once again, by taking a model and generating the corresponding uh, scattering curve and PDF for the model, and then comparing it with reality. And so we can do two, two comparisons here. We can compare the data with the C4 model and the D4 model. And you can see that, in fact, the, 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 uh, the the C4 model and the D4 model with, with eight of these guys, you know, one could, one could it's going to be hard to judge. Basically, scattering amplitudes are, are a little bit flaky in the sense that they depend on other things like solvation shells and such. So if we don't pay attention too much to the amplitude, basically the positions would suggest that we're probably in better shape um, um, for, for, the, for the C4 and D4 as opposed to the, the 16 mer, which seems to be quite a bit off. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't duplicate this little shelf that's occurring here at all. And so from the scattering, it looks like we're in a regime where we have two layers. And it's consistent with the radii that we, we get. Um, but from the NMR, that's telling us we actually have the C4 because the NMR lines would not make any sense if it was D4. So combining the scattering and the NMR data, we can home in on the fact that what we really have is two layers of this system in solution 
And so if we model this now with a cylinder instead of a sphere, we get, we get a number that is, that is pretty close to what, what we, uh, what we uh, measure experimentally. And so the structural data, is, I think, is pretty secure that we've got, a, we've got a, a two layer system here. The question is, what does this thing do? We can reduce, we can do electrochemistry and measure the reduction potentials. We, we measure the oxidation potential of the guanine. And we can do so both uh, in the monomer and we can do so in the, in the assembled system. And indeed, we find that uh, we have only small shifts in the redox potential, so that uh, it turns out that uh, the, the, the quadruplex formation gives us some degree of stabilization, but doesn't give us a huge amount. But there's a little stabilization there. Uh, optically, we see that the monomer looks pretty much like the dye molecule by itself. Whereas in the quadruplex, it looks like, once again, the blue bands have been accentuated. In other words, there's a turnover between intensities of blue and red bands. So that kind of indicates, once again, we're get stacked more or less on top, of its, on top of our neighbors. And so this is consistent with the picture I painted before. When we do photo-driven charge separation now and recombination, basically, in the monomer, we bleach out the ground state band uh, after the laser pulse is uh, absorbed. And once again, we produce this infrared band due to the reduction of the dye molecule. And interestingly, this only lasts for 13 picoseconds. So you say to yourself, uh, what's, what's wrong here? This, this is not, not going to be very good. Uh, so the question is, what does the quadruplex do for us? Well, it turns out the quadruplex does uh, small miracles for us because, for instance, we see the, we see the um, formation of the charge-separated state in about 100 picoseconds. And so that's, that's a really a reasonably high yield. It turns out the excited state lifetime of the dye intrinsically is about 4 nanoseconds. So what we're really talking about is about a 96% yield of charge separation. And now, instead of lasting 13 picoseconds, it lasts 1.2 nanoseconds. So we've got, what we've done is we've essentially increased the lifetime of the charge separation about 100 times by using the G quadruplex structure. So what does that really mean? Well, what we think it means is that, once again, the charges are being shared amongst the PDIs on, on the electron side. And on the whole side, we think we're getting charge sharing in the quadruplex core. Uh, unfortunately, at one nanosecond, this is too, sharp, too short of a time scale for EPR which has a kind of minimum time scale of about 30 or 40 nanoseconds. So we're blind to this by EPR, so we can't do the commensurate experiment. But basically, this once again shows that the right kind of structure can result in, in a charge, uh, charge delocalization or hopping having a uh, uh, salutary effect on our ability to prolong the charge separation in these ordered structures. Let me give you one more example. Let me give you a linear example this time. In a linear example, basically, and this is pretty remarkable, actually. This is simply, uh, uh, what this, this crazy long name here is just, here's our PDI die. This diketo parole parole is this, this object in the middle. It's another dye molecule, which acts as a good electron donor, and it's used in a lot of organic photovoltaics. And so all we're going to do is to put two acceptors around this donor molecule. And what we're going to try to do is create the same kind of ordered structure in this particular case and do so with a linear system. We're not going to bother with, with radial, radial uh, symmetry. And here's show, this simply shows you what, what the spectra of the objects look like. Here's the PDI again. The DPP dye is a little bit redder, so it absorbs more of the solar spectrum. And here's the composite of the two. You can see that the molecule itself has what you'd expect in terms of uh, uh, composite spectrum. When we take this molecule now and make films of it, we can cast these films by spin coating, and then we can solve and vapor anneal them with dichloromethane for a few minutes, and then the spectra sharpen up and redshift a bit. And this redshifting and sharpening by annealing has some profound effects on the structure. We can measure redox potentials. Redox potentials are shown here. The the dye molecule is relatively easy to oxidize versus saturated calomel electrode. Here's the reduction. And so basically, the, the uh, ion pair energy is, is about 1.4 volts, and it's considerably below the excited state energy. So electron transfer within the system ought to be pretty good. Uh, if we compare some spectra now, uh, basically, if we oxidize the DPP, we need to know what that looks like when we have a hole sitting on DPP. Here's the ground state, and here's the oxidized material, and it has a, 
nice absorption band uh, in the near infrared spectrum. Same, same thing with uh, PDI, and this is well known. Here's that 700 nanometer anion band that I spoke of before. And if we take the film itself, we take this film and oxidize the film chemically, we can see that we can generate a spectrum that looks very similar to oxidized DPP, in this particular case near 800. Here you don't see the other band because we're going out farther here. And in the reduced film, this looks very similar to the PDI. So basically, we can oxidize and reduce these species in the film as well. OK, so back to structural work. The important part here is, as cast, these films are highly disordered. Whereas when you solvent vapor and them, what happens is they begin to restructure, and they restructure in interesting ways. And to make a long story short, the scattering data here shows us that not only do we get much more order in the, in the solvent vapor annealed case, in other words, we, we see the, the sharp, sharp scattering peaks start to, start, start to grow, but what this is also telling us is that in the annealed case, a large fraction of the molecules are sitting on their, on their tail end, more or less perpendicular to the substrate. In other words, the glass substrate. And so we've ordered the molecules, but they're, they're actually ordering in this direction. So if you want to make a solar cell, that's the wrong direction. However, for our purposes, all we want to do is look at charge transport through the structure. At this point, we don't care which direction it is as long as the system is ordered. And so the synchrotron uh, experiment does give us the, 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 the ordering. So once again, if we look at solution, the transient uh, absorption spectroscopy uh, shows that we get very rapid quantitative charge separation, three, three picoseconds. However, it doesn't last very long. At 340 picoseconds, it's back. In other words, we're back to ground state. So you say, well, this is not going to be a very good system because we're not going to be able to get that, those charges anywhere unless the lifetime gets substantially longer. Well, it turns out that when we look at the film spectra now, if we look at the unannealed spectra, what we find is that this spectrum looks a heck of a lot like the spectra that we get, for instance, in the oxidized and reduced film. And so this shows that, indeed, we are producing the same species in, in the film that we are in solution. But the question then is, you know, what, what is the lifetime? Well, it turns out here are the lifetimes. We can decompose this into, um, into a series of, uh, using singular value decomposition, into a series of kinetic components. And so basically, you have a fast component, which we believe is energy uh, transfer. You have this 340 picosecond component, which is essentially the same component we had before in solution. And we have a small component at six nanoseconds. So we haven't gained much by being in the film in this disordered film. It simply is too, um, too disordered to show anything particularly interesting. And in fact, when we compare this spectrum with uh, doing some electrochemistry on this film, we see essentially the same features that Basically, we can oxidize and reduce the film, but the we don't have longevity with our charge-separated species in this kind of film. Now, the contrast here is now when we vapor anneal this uh, film, the, you can notice immediately that the transient absorption spectrum changes dramatically. We have lots of sharp features here now, and these sharp features are simply due to the fact that now we have a preferred orientation of the film relative to the polarization of the laser beam. And so, indeed, that's why we have, why we have more structure in the system. But more importantly, what we find is that now we can decompose the spectrum into three components. Two components look very similar to our solution data, three picoseconds and about 330. But now we have about a 30% yield of an infinite component on this time scale. And infinite means longer than six or seven nanoseconds, which is the, the pump probe delay time from this apparatus. But the question then becomes, how long is it? Well, we can use a nanosecond laser, and we still see it's a little bit noisy, but we still, still see the same features. And if we measure the recombination time, we find that now a bi it fits to a bimolecular recombination time that's, that's really quite slow. So indeed, the longest time out here now is four microseconds with a 30% yield. So we've gone from essentially nothing to a 30% yield with a very long lifetime, much more than enough is to, get, to get our charges to an electrode. And so the bottom line here is that what we end up is a situation where we go from essentially a disordered system with a 340 picosecond lifetime to one that's, that's largely ordered that has a four microsecond life, lifetime. So this shows you once again that
uh, order goes a long way to getting you where, do you, where you need to be with regard to um, uh, this promoting long-lived charge separation, which is critical for performance of any of, these, any of these kinds of devices. Once again, we can rely on this magnetic phenomena uh, to actually try to figure out how long, where the charges are. And indeed, uh, it turns out that, uh, to make a long story short here, using the exchange interaction we measure from this, from this magnetic field effect experiment, we would predict that the distance between the charges on average is 23 angstroms, when in fact the intramolecular distance in any one of these molecules is only 14. So once again, the charges have gotten away from a single molecule and are more freely wandering around in the structure. So once again, it's, it's the same, same conclusion. Let me talk briefly about another topic that's, that's structural in nature. In other words, it turns out that you can get more for your money. In other words, in organic molecules that go historically back to uh, the mid-60s, it was found that basically you can actually have multi-exciton generation in an organic system. In other words, you can have a singlet exciton fission into two triplet exitons. So why is that good? Well, it turns out that a few years ago, Art Nozick at NREL did a nice calculation which essentially redid the Shockley quasar calculation for solar cell efficiency and determined that we could go from nominal 32% to 45% if our material could undergo singlet fission. And this would be in combination with uh, another material that would actually use the red end of the spectrum as well. But nevertheless, a 50% overall increase in efficiency without a huge increase in complexity of cell design. So this immediately re rekindled an interest in this field. And indeed, it's very simple. Basically, you promote an electron from the ground state to a lowest excited singlet state of the system. And then simultaneously with down conversion of this particular uh, molecule to a triplet state, its neighbor molecule that's coupled to it is upconverted. This is a spin allowed process. You end up with four electrons, two triplet states that are coupled in a singlet configuration. So there's no spin restriction on doing this, and you end up with a spin correlated triplet pair, which then diffuses apart. So the question is, can you do this in molecules? Well, first of all, you have to have energies that the singlet energy is greater than twice the triplet ex ex exciton energy. It helps to have the second triplet level also in the same regime. Uh, you have to go forward, not backward. You don't, you, triplet, triplet annihilation will kill this reaction if you go backwards here. But more importantly, you need optimized electronic coupling. So if we're going to slide these molecules relative to one another in some structural relationship, what's the best structure? And there's been a, uh, a lot of theory that's been done on this. And it turns out that sort of slip stacking molecules rather than being face to face really minimizes the electron repulsion integrals that are necessary to promote singlet fission. So that's the latest thinking on, on what's necessary to do with this. So the question is, can you do this? Well, it turns out that our, our good old red car paint molecule actually does this. But we have to force it to do something structurally interesting. We have to crystal engineer it. We can take one of these molecules and put four phenyl groups on the periphery. And that forces the system to go from a, its preferred face-to-face -face orientation to essentially a slip-stacked orientation. And indeed, this is not scattering anymore. This is a single crystal structure. In a single crystal structure, we, we get columns, essentially infinite columns of slip-stacked dye molecules. And so these are set up perfectly because they are 3.5 angstroms layer to layer. And so this, this looks like a good deal. And you know it's nice to have a winner on the first try, basically. Here's the solution spectra of this dye molecule, both the absorption spectrum and the emission spectrum. And so it's pretty conventional. When you go to the thin film, you find that these, these spectral lines shift. Uh, here's the, the absorption, uh, lowest energy absorption, and the uh, S0 to S2 absorption gains in intensity out here. And so what we're going to do is look cha at changes in this particular spectrum. What happens to the triplet energy in this particular case? What is the triplet energy? Well, it turns out that the triplet energy in the solid is about 1.14 volts. So we're slightly uphill here. But that doesn't matter because it turns out entropy comes to save the day. And since these are enthalpic calculations, it turns out that the fact that the two triplets can get away from each other, entropy helps a bit. And this is well known in this field in the sense that 
things, molecules that historically go back to the 60s, like tetracine, for instance, a polycyclic aromatic, uh, one easily saw a singlet fission that went uphill by 200 millivolts. All right, so basically, we're good to go energetically. So it turns out when we do transit absorption in this, we model this da data using uh, uh, an, a singlet-singlet annihilation uh, term and a singlet fission term in addition to the triplet formation. And when we do that, we get a singlet fission lifetime of 180 picoseconds. So this thing really does go because the standard excited state lifetime of this molecule, once again, is four nanoseconds. So basically, we've got a 95 plus percent yield of something else going on. And the something else we can, we can gauge from looking at a longer time scale, looking at the triplet spectrum. And when we measure the uh, triplet spectrum and then re-add in the singlet bleach, what we find is that the triplet yield is 170 plus or minus 2%, or 12, 20%. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that we're almost getting two triplet states formed for every singlet. So it looks like this material is a good candidate for application in this kind of solar cell arrangement. But what about other energetics? Well, it turns out we can go to other molecules. Like, for instance, we've crystal engineered this molecule, which is a kind of a cousin of the other one. It's got a, a longer run of benzene rings. And it turns, it forms a slightly, well, it's actually quite a different structure. It forms these very tightly coupled dimers. This structure is reminiscent of pentacene. Those of you who are familiar with a lot of the work that's gone on in uh, organic electronics and pentacene will notice that this structure is, is very similar to that. And indeed, what happens here is that in a film, once again, you get a spectrum that is, that is broad and red shifted to this edge, and then it has a blue band that's strongly accentuated. But now when we look at, this, at the transient spectrum and do the analysis, what we find is that we get about a 200% yield of single fission. So it's about as good, it's essentially as good as it gets. So the question then is, uh, can, can one use these things? And I think that's, that's still an open question. There have been a few reports in the literature now that show that you can actually do this, but uh, um, more, is to, more is to come. Last but not least, remember DPP? DPP, it turns out, has the right energetics to do this as well. And it turns out you can crystallize some of these DPP derivatives into interesting stair-step structures again. Here's one morphology that we've crystallized. And indeed, on the annealed spectrum, you can see that it covers a very large amount of the visible spectrum here. And it turns out that, once again, we can model the same thing. These, these blue bands here are the essentially triplet transient absorption spectrum. That, that occurs, uh, that, that happens fairly rapidly. In this case, singlet fission occurs in 60 picoseconds. And when we once again analyze for the triplet yield by essentially analyzing the degree of bleaching of the ground state in this particular case, we get 180% uh, yield. So basically, this too is a good system in that regard. Last but not least, let me mention one last thing. In other words, let's take another excursion into morphology. This whole stair step idea, right? We can view it as being good for singlet fission, but the question is, what if we try it in a real solar cell? What happens? Well, it turns out that we recently published a paper in collaboration with Tobin Marks that did a whole series of these dye molecules with a uh, polymer donor in a, in a real solar cell. And indeed, if we look at these derivatives, what we are doing here is putting different groups at these positions to control the degree of slip stacking. And we have crystal structures of all these, all these systems. And so it turns out that if you don't put anything there, these things stack pretty much on top of one another. If you put these long alkyl chains here, they move apart a little bit. If you put these kind of com combination of alkyls and phenyls here, they move apart a little more. Finally, if we go to our, our fully uh, phenylated system here with the phenyls attached directly, it slip stacks like I showed you earlier. And so what happens to the performance of a solar cell. It goes from, essentially in this case, from the hexyl PDI to about a half a percent, all the way to more than three and a half percent in the slip stack arrangement. So why is that? Well, it turns out that the increase in performance is simply due to a more favorable competition between other photophysical processes and charge separation and uh, charge movement into the slip stack. When these molecules are really stacked on top of one another absolutely, then what happens is the, they will form, if you excite them, they will form what's called an excimer state. In other words, the excitation or the exciton is actually shared between two neighboring molecules. And that results in a defect or trap site, which is not good for this particular system.
What about changing other qualities? Now that we have the phenyls as being the good ones, so to speak, in other words, in terms of performance, what about this group at the end, the tail over here? We can change that at will, too. And so we change that tail, and basically for the octal tail, we get the highest performance. And here we're using diiodo-octane as a, essentially um, a ingredient that actually relaxes the morphology, as it were. And this is a well-known phenomena in, in OPV research that the, the diiodo-octane has this, has this annealing effect, if you will. And so with no diiodo-octane, octal wins out tr tremendously, but with even a little bit of, of, of diiodo-octane, diiodo the dimethyl octal wins out. And ultimately, if you put a little bit more, you go back to these two. So what's really happening here? Well, what's happening is we can actually figure out what goes on from the crystal structure. And under these various, various tail uh, assemblies, we get different morphologies. Like, for instance, the, the, the rhombic little platelets here have a really strange structure. In other words, they have one molecule that's almost perpendicular to its neighbors. And so that results in actually poor performance. And we, we surmise that every time we put in the iodo-octane, we, perf we preferentially induce this structure in certain molecules, whereas we know, for instance, the needles that form are, in fact, this structure. And so, once again, morphology controls performance in this particular case. So as long as we maintain this columnar slip-stacked arrangement, we get high performance. Now, what is high performance? Well, if you turn back the clock even two or three years ago, high performance with a perylene dye was uh, less, well, well under a percent and irreproducible, and once again, because these of these competitive photophysical processes. It turns out that some of the best, best systems out there now are almost 6% with perylene dyes. Why do you want a perylene dye? Why don't you want the classical fullerene in here? Well, fullerenes are not particularly good with regard to stability. They're expensive, and they don't absorb light very well. So the only thing they have going for them is that they're three-dimensional. Charge can enter the fullerene from all directions, so it's isotropic. But we can probably produce an isotropic version of one of these perylene dyes as well, and that, that's coming up uh, in the near future. Last but not least, remember I said that stacking is bad. At least some, you know, full stacking is bad. So another way to beat the, beat the stacking is to actually make this whole system essentially twisted. And so we can take two of these molecules and essentially twist them by joining them in a very funny way here, by joining these rings, and compare them with what happens if you just go straight on like this one and this one. And it turns out, make a long story short, if you twist them so they really can't stack very well, but still allow them to get close enough, performance is still good. This is almost 4%. Whereas if you look at, for instance, the molecule in which this is straight and allowed to be flat, we're you know, way down in the dumps here at 0.2%. So basically, this idea of turning off one type of photophysics and turning on another is important. And you know, if you look transiently at what's going on in some of these systems, what you find is, is reflected in the lifetime of the charge separation. You've got much more of this long-lived component going on. In other words, you generate charges and they get away from each other. They're not, they're not, they're not trapped in, in, a, in a bound pair that's close together. So these molecules work pretty well. So basically, decreasing, decreased geminate recombination in the fused dimer increases current density. And increased density and fill factors are really responsible for the nicety of what goes on with these twisted systems. And so uh, with that, let me just summarize where I've been here. Uh, basically, I've showed you that ordered non-covalent self-assembled systems can be prepared, and they pro pro provide an integrated system for light capture and charge separation. Um, it doesn't matter whether we're radial or linear. We can design systems that we can generate these charge conduits that compete effectively for moving charges rapidly with charge recombination, which kills your charge. Um, singlet exciton fission is going to be a promising new direction with regard to essentially getting more for your money. In other words, being able to generate more excitons for a single photon being absorbed. If we can use those excitons to good effect, in other words, to you know, oxidize or reduce uh, uh, another material, then we can actually achieve much higher uh, performance uh, in, a, in a solar cell. Uh, 
And last but not least, in, if to use these, these uh, flat dye molecules properly, you have to turn off other photophysical processes like exomer formation. And I think we know how to do that now. And, and you know, for a long time, we didn't. And so I think we're in a good, good spot right now to continue. Last but not least, let me thank some people who did the work. Vladimir here is in the audience, Vladimir Rosniotovsky, who did the porphyrin work and a lot of PDI work. Pat Hartnett is a joint student with Tobin Marks, and he did the, the, the twisted stuff at the end and the linear, linear systems. Eric Margulies did a lot of the nanosecond work. Leah Shore did a, a fair amount, along with Ryan Young of the femtosecond work. And Sam Eaton is Mr. Singlet Fission, who's now actually postdocing at Berkeley with Pei Dong Yang. And so Sam, Sam really got us really launched into the singlet fission business. Supports come from DOE exclusively, uh, both from uh, individual grants and from the EFRC. And with that, uh, thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions. I have actually two questions. First question, you're always comparing radial and uh, linear chains. Is that because of the ordering or because of charge separation? And what do you think will be a better example, radial or linear? Well, I think, I think the jury is out on that now. It turns out that we started with radial because we thought we had to fill in the space to get a better ordered system and to isolate the whole channel from the electron channel or vice versa. But it turns out that in, in a large fraction of linear systems, if it's ordered properly, you get the same effect. All you really don't want, all you want to avoid is uh, the um, short circuiting of the holes in the electrons. Right, but actually if you have linear, then you can extract the hole easier than in the case when you have radial, because radial. Uh, not, well, I think it's the same problem, problem. actually. I think, that, I think they're equivalent. Basically, you still have to have an electron blocking layer on one electrode and a hole blocking layer on the other so that you don't ultimately, by the time they get to both reach the electrode, then recombine. So you need to have them reflect off that barrier. Uh, can I ask the second question quickly? So the last example about uh, 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 singlet fission, you had the, the efficiency of 3.8 something and the voltage of one volt, which is huge. So are they operating on a singlet fission or they're operating? Ah, that's a, that's a very good question. It turns out that the, 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 those systems are, are probably not operating with singlet fission. Um, and there are, there, are, there are a variety of really crazy reasons for that. But um, the, the other example as well, you'll notice that both DPP and PDI will singlet fission. Yeah. But they singlet fission slowly. See, that's the key. They singlet fission on the order of 100 picoseconds, whereas the electron transfer rate occurs in, from the singlet before it fissions, occurs in a few picoseconds. So kinetically, you're in a funny position because your electron transfer beats singlet fission. So what you need to do is have the opposite situation. Okay, right. So we have some systems that are based on functionalized tetracines and other you know, cousins of these molecules where singlet fission is sub-picosecond, right? Then you, get, then you get a component. But this is the weird case where it's backwards. In other words, singlet fission is actually slower. So, hi, Mike. Uh, really great stuff. So now you have all these um, triplet states and, uh, and holes and electrons living for nanoseconds on these assemblies. Are you going do you feel that at some point you run into problems of these things uh, ultimately quenching excited states? So, I mean, how, how long, I mean, you have long lived and they're trapped in these domains, and so uh, w will your yields be limited in the end by how fast you can bleed triplet states or charges out? Well, I, yeah, I think, I think ultimately if you created a lot, of, a lot of holes in electrons, they would quench subsequent photons but being absorbed. Any, have you seen those effects yet? I mean, no, nice so far we problem. haven't seen any evidence of that, which is interesting because uh, basically I think we're, our recombination uh, times are suffi still sufficiently short that we're not running into that. The way out of the box is to have a drain, and the drain is to have the electrodes. And so the electrodes, uh, if you play your cards right, you should have 
hole hopping or electron hopping rates that are no worse than 10 picoseconds. So realistically, you can get to your electrode in a matter of a nanosecond. And so it shouldn't be an issue because the absorption rate of photons is, can't catch up with that. I guess um, this whole talk was about PV, but then the other place to collect charges would be on catalysts for fuels. Yeah, so I, 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 had to, I, I made a conscious choice to focus on the one because, you know, I ran out of time anyway. <laughs> and so, so, yes, obviously this is all, all applicable to feeding the electrons or holes into catalysts as well. Same concepts entirely. Uh, it's just what do you use them for? You either use them to collect via an electrode or you use them to do chemistry. Hi. Um, I have a, a related question. So I imagine the, with the singlet fission experiments that the triplet yields you, quote, were probably measured at fairly low light intensities or extrapolated to low intensities. So I'm wondering how those intensities relate to, say, sort of common ambient solar intensities on the, on the Earth. Yeah, I mean, in our lowest intensities, they compare fairly favorably. I mean, basically, these are all ultra-fast laser experiments uh, on, the, on the short end, right? But um, our current laser apparatus is uh, a high repetition rate, very low fluence per pulse system. And so we, are, we don't even have to model these anymore with annihilation of the singlet states. We are an annihilation-free regime so that we get very clean kinetics. So we're in a... We're in a one photon per 100,000 molecule regime. Okay, I have a really basic question. Um, early on, you had these nice uh, self-assembled um, structures. And the more of the monomers you would put together up into uh, dodecamer, you would uh, increase the charge separation lifetime. Um, and so my question is, how is it that you actually get it to stop at a dodecamer? Why, why does it do that? Right, that's, that's a very good question. I, guess I, get that asked, I get asked that a lot, actually. And it turns yeah, out that- Yeah, because it's weird. <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically, it's a snapshot, because if you, let, if you let these, it's a question of how quickly they build. They build to a certain part, and then basically, you have a propagating defect, which slows down the rate of building further. And what happens is if you let them sit in solution for days, eventually they will get bigger and precipitate. So it's self-limiting in the sense that you reach a solubility limit. Anything bigger precipitates, ah, right? So that's, that's the secret, if you will, is to, you know, you get to a certain point, and that's all you have in solution because everything else crashed out. Electronic coupling. Yeah, we do that um, all the time. Along electron transfer path. Yeah, pathway. no, that's a, that's an excellent question. We do that all the time. Yeah, it's. Uh, in fact, we like that technique a lot, and indeed, we we're able to get electronic coupling matrix elements from the J values. In fact, we've got probably now dozens of molecules. In fact, I've, one of my students is actually trying to generate a paper that uses that technique with all this entire suite of molecules we have to work backwards to trying to figure out if we know coupling, uh, under what regimes do we actually know delta G under unusual solvation conditions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, it's, it's a w very powerful tool, I think, that's been somewhat neglected. Yeah, and if like these correlate with your charge separation yeah. or Yeah, they correlate very well, actually. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I, we have a string of publications that actually feature this, this in it, and it, we like that technique very much. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank Mike again for a wonderful talk.